Okay. In section 6.3, we're going to extend the concept of the wave-particle duality that was observed for electromagnetic radiation. We're going to understand the general idea of quantum mechanical descriptions of electrons in an atom, that it uses the notion of a three-dimensional wave function, or orbitals, uh, that define the distribution of probability to find an electron in a particular part of space, and we're going to list and describe the traits of four quantum numbers that form the basis of completely specifying the state of an electron or atom. So, in the development of quantum theory, particles and waves are very different phenomena in the macroscopic realm, but they start to become almost the same thing in the quantum realm. Um, this became clear in the 1920s uh, that small pieces of matter follow a different set of rules than the, what we observe in the macroscopic world. Um, and that there, the separation between waves and particles starts to break down when we get really small. Louis de Broglie, um, if an electromagnetic radiation can have particle-like character, can electrons and other submicroscopic particles exhibit wave-like behavior. In 1925, Louis de Broglie extended the wave-particle duality of light that Einstein used to solve the photoelectric effect paradox to materials particles. And he did that uh, by defining something called the de Broglie wavelength. Um, and then a Broglie wavelength is uh, described mathematically here. It's Planck's constant divided by the mass of that particle times the velocity of that particle um, or Planck's constant divided by the momentum because mass times velocity is equal to moment, uh, momentum. Um, in this wavelength, it's a characteristic of a particle, not a actually electromagnetic radiation like we saw wavelengths be before. Um, so Bohr had postulated that the electron is being a particle orbiting the nucleus in quantized orbits. De Broglie argued that Bohr's assumption of quantization can be, exp can be explained if the electron is considered a circular standing wave. Only an integer number of wavelengths can fit exactly within the orbit. So if we look at that here, what he's saying is just like we saw for the standing waves, we're only going to have certain waves uh, that are going to be able to fit. So if we only have half integer allowed waves, and they have a specific wavelength, then there's only going to be certain distances away from the nucleus that are going to be able to have these stable waves where things start to come back and everything lines up nicely. For a circular orbit of radius r, the circumference is 2 pi r, and so de Broglie's conditions are that 2 pi r is going to equal n lambda, uh, where n is equal to 1, 2, or 3. This means that the only permiss permissible circumferences are multiples of the de Broglie wavelength. So de Broglie had given us some sense that electrons were behaving like waves, but we, we really didn't have great experimental evidence that this was true until Davison and Germer demonstrated experimentally that electrons can exhibit wavelength behavior. They showed that electrons traveling through a regular atomic pattern in a crystal produced an interference pattern. The interference pattern was very similar to those that we saw at the beginning of this talk for light. So if we picture what they were doing, they're shooting electrons at this uh, split. It moves out and propagates as a wave, causing constructive and destructive interference, and then forms these regular patterns on a uh, screen where they could view where the electrons had hit.
So it appears that while electrons are small localized particles, their motion doesn't follow the equations of motions implied by classical mechanics. They don't work quite the same as like a baseball thrown or something like that. Instead, the wave, uh, the way they travel as some kind of wave that we can describe using something called a wave equation. The next bit of information came from Werner Heisenberg. He determined that there is a fundamental limit to how accurately one can measure both a particle's position and its momentum simultaneously. Um, basically, he said that the more accurately we measure the momentum of a particle, the less accurately we can determine its position at that time um, or vice versa. And this becomes known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We can see that written out mathematically here. So if, if delta x is the uh, uncertainty in the position and delta p is the uncertainty and the momentum, this always has to be higher than this h bar over 2, where h bar is uh, it's Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Um, so this is just a number, a constant. So if you imagine here, if this has to equal a constant, as one of these goes to zero, say delta x goes to zero, um, delta p is going to approach infinity, and vice versa. As this uncertainty went to zero, this would have to, this would get very, very large. So we can't know both of these at the same time, so the question becomes how do we handle this? And the answer is we need to handle it statistically. And that's where we start to come in with Erwin Schrodinger. He extends de Broglie's work by incorporating the, the de Broglie relationship into a, a wave equation. Um, this equation is now known as Schrodinger's equation. And what Schrodinger was able to actually figure out is he thought of the electron in terms of a three-dimensional stationary wave or wave function. And he represented it by the Greek letter psi. And wave functions are functions that basically contain all of the information about any mechanical situ um, any mechanical system. Uh, but really, the only wave functions that we can fully understand are for the simplest cases, which would be for like single particles or small particle systems. A few late years later, Max Born um, said that electrons are still particles, and so the waves represented by psi are not physical waves, but instead complex probability amplitudes. And what he means by complex here is like a complex number, like they contain imaginary numbers, i.e. like the square root of negative one. Um, and so to deal with that, right, uh, to actually get to probabilities that we can work with, he started to uh, assume, he started to look at the, uh, what they call the complex conjugate of the wave functions. And that's described here with these horizontal bars and this square. Basically, he takes the wave function, he multiplies it by its complex conjugate, and in doing so, he clears that imaginary portion, and he winds up getting out of that a, uh, a not entirely intuitive probability distribution function. So this probability distribution function tells you where it's probable and likely that a electron be uh, around the nucleus. And from this, he can in, infer the electron density with respect to the nucleus in an atom. So you'll often see Schrodinger's equation written in this um, somewhat interesting form here that you actually have to get like pretty far in math to really understand. But what he's saying is that there is an operator. This is called a Hamiltonian. And, and what you can think about an operator as, is it's just like a set of instructions. It's a set of instructions, mathematical instructions, 
you know, add this, subtract that, multiply this, blah, 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 that you're going to perform on your wave function. And what you're going to get out of that is going to be the energy, so a constant value that is the energy, times the uh, wave function. This is what is known as an eigenproblem or uh, eigen equation, where you perform a set of instructions on a function and that returns the same function with some sort of constant in front of it. And there's a whole bunch of set of rules for how you handle eigenfunctions. Schrodinger's work, as well as that of Heisenberg and many other scientists following in their footsteps, uh, really laid the groundwork for what has become quantum mechanics. Um, some of the other great scientists that, con that uh, contributed to this work, there was Slater, who uh, really spelled out some of the first functions that uh, properly describe the orbitals of um, electrons. Uh, there was a guy named Hartree who developed a method for both calculating those orbitals and figuring out some of their uh, energies. Uh, Fock worked on Hartree stuff to kind of uh, perfect it a little bit more. Um, Mulliken did a lot of really interesting work. He, he was working well up into the, like, uh, I believe the sixties on, um, spin, spin coupling and a few other things, that, uh, more complex electron, electron interactions. Um, and there's still many people who are working in this field today. So what are our takeaways here? Electrons and atoms can exist only in discrete energy levels, but not between them. The energy of an electron in an atom is quantized. So that's really a restatement of that first uh, bullet there. The energy can be equal only to certain specific values and can jump from one energy to another, but not transition smoothly or stay between these levels. Um, the energy levels are labeled with an n value, where n is some integer. Generally speaking, the energy of an electron in an atom is greater for larger values of n. Um, and that usually means that it, the electron is further away from the nucleus. n is referred to as the principal quantum number or shell number. The principal quantum number defines the location of the energy level and is similar in concept in the Bohr model. So here you can see as n goes up, you're getting further and further away from the nucleus. So atomic orbitals. The principal quantum number is one of three quantum numbers used to characterize an orbital. An atomic orbital is a general region in an atom that an electron is most probable to reside. An atom's orbital is distinct from an orbit. Okay, so this is, we're talking about a generalized region here with an orbital. So this is like a three-dimensional object that has volume, which is different than an orbit, which is just a path, right? The quantum mechanical model specifies the probability of finding an electron in a three-dimensional space. All right. So the next quantum number that we need to be concerned about is the angular momentum quantum number. This is usually uh, shown as a scripted L. It's an integer that defines the shape of the orbital. An L will take on values of integer values all the way up to n minus 1. So 0 through n minus 1. So if n is 1, L can only be 0. If n is 2, n minus 1 is 1, L has values of 0 and 1. If n was 3, n minus 1 would be 2, L could take on values of 0, 1, and 2. Um, so a lot of times, instead of using these numbers for the L values, we uh, instead use letters that represent the types of orbitals. 
for zero, there are the s orbitals, one, there are the p orbitals, two, there are the d orbitals, and three, there are the f orbitals. Where they're getting these letters from, I really honestly have no idea. I've been looking for years and I've never found out. All right, radial nodes. So there are certain distances from the nucleus at which the probability density of finding an electron located in a particular orbit is zero. So these are what is known as are the radial nodes. This is the three-dimensional version of what we saw before with the standing waves. Um, the number of radial nodes is n minus l minus 1. So we have a couple of cases here. For instance, if n is equal to 3 and l is equal to 0, then there's going to be 3 minus 0 minus 1, 2 nodes. All of these cases apply to the s orbitals, which actually look like spheres. So let's picture what this means. So in the first case, we had zero nodes, and we just get a sphere around the nucleus. In the second case, we have one node. So we have a larger sphere that is the 2s orbital, and the node is in the center where um, the 1s orbital is occupying largely, right? You can see that there is some overlap between this node. Um, you can see that it's not perfect, right? There's some overlap between the two orbitals. It's not like the 1s orbital only exists where the node is, but they do roughly correspond to one another here. And similarly, here we have another shell on top of it with nodes that occur where the 2s and the 1s orbital is. And again, it's not perfect, but they roughly correspond with each other. There's some overlap between these, but not much. So what are these shapes of these different orbitals? They're actually pretty exotic. So the S subshell has a spherical shape. The P subshell looks kind of like a dumbbell. And the D and the F orbitals are a little bit more complex. So let's, let's take a look at them here. Here we have our S orbital. Here we have our P orbitals. This could be arranged around the X, the Z, or the Y axis. These are all of our D orbitals here. You can see that there's actually one um, pretty exotic one here that doesn't quite follow the same clover shape as the others. And then down here we have our F orbitals with this guy here, which is also pretty crazy looking. It's got these little rings around it here, just like this guy. Those are called the uh, torix. The next quantum number is the magnetic quantum number. So if an orbital has an angular momentum of L equal to zero, then this orbital can point in different directions. The magnetic quantum number ML specifies the orientation of the orbit, or L that is an equal to zero the uh, orientation of the orbit in space. So the value of m sub l depends on the value of l, and it varies from negative l all the way up to positive l, okay? And there are two l plus one orbitals with the same l value. So one s orbital for l equals zero. There are three p orbitals for l equals one. So if I put one in here, I'm going to get three, right? Two times one plus one is three. Five for the d orbitals and seven for the f orbitals. Okay, so what that, and what that really means is if we come back here, right? Here for the p's, for instance, we have l equals one. We're going to go from negative L to positive L. Um, so we start off at negative one, and that's going to be your PX orbital. At zero, that's going to be your PZ orbital. And then at positive one, you're going to have your PY uh, orbital. 
um, I actually set that wrong. So at negative one, you're going to have your PX orbital. At zero, you're going to have your PY orbital. And then the last one at, I don't know why the book arranged them this way. But at one, you're going to have your PZ orbital. So the number of MLs is the number of orientations that that orbital can take on. Here is where we see that there are five D orbitals, right? And these are all seven of the F orbitals. Okay. When referring to an orbital, usually both the n value and the letter designation for l value are reported. So you'll write something like, I'm talking about quantum number two, or principal quantum number two, and I'm talking about the s orbital there. So the l value is zero. Or I'm talking about principal, principal quantum number three, n equals three. And I'm talking about when L is equal to one, and I'm talking about the P orbital. In the case of the hydrogen atom, energies of all orbitals with the same N are the same. This is called a degeneracy, and the energy levels with the same principal quantum numbers, N, are all called degenerate energy levels. However, in atoms with more than one electron, this degeneracy is eliminated by electron-electron interactions. Orbitals that belong to different subshells have different energies. Orbitals within the same subshell are still degenerate and have the same energy. Okay. Um, Pairing electrons in the same orbital requires energy because the electrons repel one another. So here we can see that as energy goes up and we start to add on electrons, we get different energy levels. So first we're going to fill this 1s shell, then we're going to fill the 2s shell, then we're going to fill the 2p shell, okay? But because pairing them off is uh, requires energy, first we're going to put one electron here, one electron here, one electron here. Then we start pairing them off because each one of our, these orbitals is going to be able to hold two electrons. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. And what this leads us to is our fourth and final quantum number, the spin quantum number. So the first three quantum numbers, N, L, and M, L, to find the region of space where an electron is most likely located. The electron spin is a different kind of property. Electron spin describes an intrinsic electron rotation or spinning. An electron can only spin in one of two quantized states. So the book makes this statement and I do have to mention that it's actually pretty much wrong. <laughs> the electron isn't really spinning. Um, what's really happening is that this principal quantum number is existing. It does work just like this. But what it's really trying to get at is that electrons have a directional vector that's associated with magnetism. Spin is to magnetism the same as electricity or as charge is to electricity. It's the smallest unit of magnetism. Um, so that's just a little extra note for you guys. The spin quantum number, ms, describes the two possible states. So you can have plus one half or you can have negative one half. And the basic idea being that if I had a vector that was pointing through it, um, it could be up or it could be down. Um, and traditionally, the notion was that this electron was spinning. Um, it's really honestly only been in the last years that this has really been debunked, um, that, they're, that they really have this spin to them. Um, but... You can kind of think of it like the electron being a little magnet with a north and a south pole that could be uh, oriented in one way or another. 
um, when you apply an outside electric field. Basically, if I apply this outside magnetic field here, the electron can orient to it or can orient against it. Okay, so the Pauli exclusion principle. An electron in an atom is completely described by the four quantum numbers, N, L, M, L, and M, S. Wolfgang Pauli, an Austrian physicist, formulated a general principle. This is called the Pauli exclusion principle. It says that no two electrons in the same atom can have exactly the same set of all four quantum numbers. So by giving all four quantum numbers, we can uh, describe exactly which electron we're talking about. Uh, electrons can share the same orbital, but they will wind up having different MS numbers. They'll be, a, they'll be arranged opposite one another. Since the spin quantum numbers can only have two values, plus or minus one half, no more than two electrons can occupy the same orbital. So every orbital gets two electrons, max. It doesn't have to have two electrons. It could have one electron in it, but can't fit more than two. If two electrons are located in the same orbital, they must have opposite spins. So here's a nice little table that is um, summarizing the allowable values for N, L, ML, and MS.